I must say it's very very cold out here but it's also very very nice it's quite late at night I don't know how cold it is um, can you see that It's just moisture in the air. Silly joke. <coughs> now, fuck. Now, one of the things uh, that a lot of people commented on the Old English interview video was how can we possibly know what a dead language sounded like. You know, we, we've never heard any recordings of this language. It's impossible to know how it sounded. But we can actually get a surprisingly good idea of the phonology of Old English um, from various um, sources of evidence. Jackson Crawford's done a very good video on this in relation to Old Norse, so I'd recommend you watch that. But seeing as so many people have um, commented um, questions to that effect, I thought I'd make a video on it as well. Now I'm back home and have my camera and everything. Um, I will try not to overlap too much and I'm sorry I have a cold so my voice is possibly a bit strange and I've just travelled on the train, I've not had a shower in a, uh, a little while so apologies for the dishevelled dishevelledness. Now there are three, well there are many key strands of evidence to reconstructing the sound of Old English but three key ones are the fact that you have a lot of modern English dialects that you can sort of triangulate backwards. The complication of that being of course that there were Old English dialects as well. We're not thinking of one homogenous entity so you can't necessarily triangulate all modern English dialects back to one Old English dialect but but it's, it's helpful to have modern English dialects, modern English phonology. Um, number two is um, that of course we have a big corpus of texts written in Old English, particularly the Ormulum, 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 I think, um, which is a 12th century text, which is very, very useful indeed because it actually lays out its own orthography quite emphatically. It's sort of saying, I don't want to be making spelling mistakes; I want to be representing pronunciation correctly. Um, so that gives us a very, very good snapshot of how pronunciation was at that time. Um, we have an understanding of how uh, the laws of sound change work, so that helps us enormously. Um, and we also have loan words uh, into Old English from languages whose uh, phonology is better established, like uh, Latin, although obviously those were probably loan words to Proto-Germanic if it was actual classical Latin. Um, this all gives us a pretty good base uh, of knowledge to work with. I thought that waiting for the next night and filming it again might um, cure me of my cold and make me less tired, but it's not happened. But notwithstanding this, a good base for reconstructing the phonology of Old English is uh, the phonology of classical Latin, because obviously when Old English started being written in um, the Latin alphabet, they would have used similar values to the classical Latin values, they wouldn't have picked random values for the letters. Um, and we know a very large amount about classical Latin phonology, because well first we have all of the modern Romance languages to sort of triangulate back, and secondly the Romans actually talked about their phonology, they wrote about their phonology. Um, in, in, in surprisingly modern terms. So that's a very good base, um, as, as close to an ob objective base as we can get for understanding Old English phonology. Um, so a lot of the vowels are fairly uncontroversial. You know, you have a lot of peripheral vowels, which are vowels towards the sort of the outermost limit of what's of, of human articulation. So if you're looking at a vowel quadrilateral, they'll be towards the edges. So you have U, which is fairly uncontroversial. E, E is fairly uncontroversial. Um, 
and then you have this sort of you have this sort of trio of sounds. You have a, and then you have the sound represented by the letter a, and then you have the sound represented by the letter ash. Um, now the reason ash was added to the alphabet was probably because the the six Latin vowel letters. Uh, did not cut it for Old English because the Germanic languages have some of the most, you know, the largest vowel inventories in the world, excluding some African languages which have something like 30 vowels, which is... But yeah, Old English didn't have enough vowel letters, so it had to sort of play around with a few. Now, ash looks obviously like a cross between an E and an A, so it, it stands to reason, particularly given the development of um, sounds in modern English that derive from this this ash sound, whatever it was, um, that it was somewhere between an E and an A, uh, and an E and an R in terms of pronunciation. Now the A in Old English probably represented a sound like R. Often in languages with smaller inventories of vowels, an A represents a vowel like A. But in Old English, you know, given the development of this um, sound into Middle English where it became or, and into later English, Modern English where it becomes o in my dialect anyway, um, we presume a more backed quality for this vowel. So something like r. In front of a nasal vowel, like n or m, um, it seems to become even more backed because in those situations you get... Um, inconsistencies in spelling where authors from the same area or sometimes the same author in the same piece of writing will alternate between using A to represent it and using O to represent it. So you get words like land um, or man where it's, it's clearly, it clearly lies somewhere on the boundary between what people consider to be an A sound and what people consider to be an O sound. So in front of a nasal, it's probably something like R. And when it's not in front of a nasal, it's probably something like R. Um, so where's the ash then? It's, it, it's probably about halfway in between, but it, it, it's probably cardinal. It's probably fairly, what's the word, peripheral, because most vowels are. Um, so we're thinking something along the lines of A, ah, and that's how it's normally reconstructed. Um, but even there, there's a little room for manoeuvre. Um, Old English made a distinction between uh, long and short vowels, and it might be that the short version of this sound was not the same uh, in realisation as the long version of it. So the short version went on to become a ah in modern English, so habbon became to have. Um, but the long version of it went on to become air in Middle English and then e in Modern English, so met in Middle English and then meat in Modern English, as in the stuff you eat. Um, so it might be that in Old English it was mat and had pretty much the same value as the, the short version, or it might have been that it was met, like in Middle English. Um, it's, not, it's not clear, it's, it's something that we can't really determine from writing just because, again, there aren't enough vowel letters to delineate the... the um, is delineate the right word? To, to split up the, the spectrum that is the vowel inventory uh, in that way. It might be that U and E and E also had differing short and long um, realisations. Um, like in modern English, you know, you have U and U, uh, you have E and I. These have slightly different vowel qualities from short to long. Um, but there are plenty of dialects of English where the pairs do not have differing vowel qualities. So I tend to, if I'm speaking Old English, I tend to just go for the same vowel quality for short and long. E, E, U, U, E, E. Um, but it could be, could be that this wasn't the way they pronounced it. And of course you'd have regional variation as well. One question I've been asked a little bit in person is, would they have said the w sound like a v? As a German person, you know, 
you know, in German, the W in English generally corresponds with a V in German, so water to Wasser. Um, so would old English people have said V? Um, and the answer to that is no, they would not. I mean, there might have been some tiny fringe dialects that weren't recorded, but, but, but aside from that, you know, in general, no, they wouldn't have said V, they would have said W. Um, w was the original quality of that vowel in German, if you go back far enough. It was the original quality in Proto-Germanic. And indeed, it was the original quality. I said vowel, I meant semi-vowel, anyway. And it was the original quality in Proto-Indo-European as well. Um, there are a number of clues that indicate this. Um, and I won't list all of them, but I'll list a few of them. Um, so, first of all, in Old English, you have fricative sounds like s, th, f, sounds where there is, you know, the tongue is touching a place of articulation in the mouth and you're blowing air through and it's creating friction. So, s, th, f. Now, these can be either voiced z, v, th, or voiceless s, f, th. Um, the articulation is the same, it's just whether you've got your voice box on, as it were. Um, in Old English, these pairs of the voiced and the voiceless were allophonic, which means that, for example, an Old English speaker wouldn't consider there to be a difference between s and z, or th and the. At least, the, they'd be able to hear the difference, but they wouldn't be able to, they, they wouldn't consider them to be different sounds, they just consider them to be the same sound in different environments, said in slightly different ways. Um, now, there was a complementary distribution sort of system where the voiced variant of the fricative occurred between two other voiced sounds. <coughs> this leaves its mark on modern English in the plurals of some words with fricatives at the end, so wolf but wolves or elf, but elves, and these come from the Old English wolf, wolvos, uh, alf, alve. Um, so a, fric a voiced fricative, generally speaking in Old English, would only occur in the middle of a word between two other voiced um, sounds. And this means that you will not find it, generally speaking, at the start of a word. So you're not going to find a V sound at the start of a word, generally speaking, in Old English. Um, and also, if they were going to write it at the start of a word, it would be spelt with an F, because that's how they spelled these, you know, that's how they spelled V, because uh, it was allophonic with F. So the fact that you find a separate letter, WIN, in some manuscripts, and then W later on, representing this sound suggests that it's a different sound than v. <coughs> in modern English it's w. Um, you know, other Proto-Indo-European languages triangulated back indicate that it was w in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, it's been reconstructed as w in Proto-Germanic. So um, the, the sensible thing to think it would seem is that it was w in Old English as well. And it's also written later on, obviously, with a W, um, which is a, an adaptation, a doubling up of the Latin letter, um, well, this Latin letter, which is known to have represented either an U or a W, depending on its place in the word. <coughs> so, you know, all of that would, would seem to very strongly point to it being W rather than V. So, water. There are all sorts of other finer details of Old English pronunciation that have been reconstructed pretty reliably, um, such as, for example, the velarization of l to l in certain positions, um, the nature of the letter r. Now, I, I'd normally have it as a r, a trill. I think that's fair. that's not really controversial. Um, that's the most common rhotic consonant, although I don't really know what the definition of rhotic consonant is, just a consonant that's spelt with an R, I suppose. Um, but you've got to acknowledge it was probably different from place to place as it is now in the English-speaking world. <coughs> um, 
you know the the full um, cardinal pronunciations of vowels in unstressed syllables, which is an interesting one because people tend to go with the sort of the German model of of, of de-stressing vowels in unstressed uh, sorry weakening vowels in unstressed syllables, um, which which doesn't seem to have been done in Old English uh, until later on. You can tell because people start mixing the letters up. And the double length of certain consonants when they're written with a double letter, um, which is part of the reason I sounded a bit Swedish at times in the Old English interview video. So, habon, setan, instead of habon, setan, because, uh, because there's a double consonant in writing and there, there was probably a double consonant in pronunciation as well. But another compelling thing is that sound change is very reliable and very systematic and, and, and very almost predictable. If you, if you know how uh, a sound has changed in one word, you know how it's changed in another word. Um, and the reconstructed version of Old English, as much as there is a little bit of debate about it to this day, quite a lot actually of debate, um, it makes perfect sense in terms of its development through Middle English to Modern English. And I think that's one of the most compelling things, <coughs> is that the model fits everything we understand, and it also makes sense uh, that it has phonologically developed to Modern English. So that is a very non-exhaustive description of how we know how Old English was pronounced. Um, thank you very much for watching. I should, I should be making another video on Sunday or Monday next week. So I will see you then. Thank you for watching. Have a good winter.